We think of banks as places that store our money and keep it safe. But that's not really what's going on. Banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. They don't lend by running down one account and increasing another. They lend by increasing debt and increasing deposits at the same time. When a bank gives out a loan, they don't get poorer. They simply type new money into your bank account. It's brand new money that didn't exist before. I'm irritated by having models which are unrealistic, false, and lead us to making catastrophic mistakes about how we manage the real economy. What I'm doing now is taking on the point where Michael talks about lending out of thin air, and I'm going to elaborate on that money multiplier model and beginning of loanable funds. And now Michael comes on and asks for details about Michael loanable funds. So let's watch from this point. How is it the case in your understanding that the bank is creating the money out of thin air? It's not actually thin air. It's a flippant term which uh, makes it easy to distinguish from the idea of banks lending somebody else's money to you, which is the loanable funds model. But it also diminishes the status of what's going on. Well, if you imagine you're lending to a friend, what happens? Your bank account goes down, so there's a negative, and therefore you're lending out of your account. And then it goes into your friend's account. So lending between two individuals who are not banks is one bank goes account goes down, the other goes up, and the one that goes down is being lent out of in that sense. What happens in the real world is that banks lend out of nothing. It isn't that they lend out of nothing. They, they don't lend by running down one account and increasing another. They lend by increasing debt and increasing deposits at the same time. And that's how banks create money. I now have a million pounds, which I owe the bank, but it's going to take me about 30 years to pay it back. But the person I've just bought the house from has a million pounds in their bank account. The money supply has increased by a million pounds until that debt gets paid down, at which point it will sort of disappear again. Is that? Am I on the right track? Yeah, that's exactly the right track. So let's take a look at that in my Revel software here. So what I've set up is the textbook model. Of course, textbooks don't use double entry bookkeeping. If they did, they wouldn't use this model either to be obvious what their flaw is. They use supply and demand diagrams and they pretend that actually tells you what's going on. So what I've done is I've taken the textbook supply and demand model and put it in double entry bookkeeping terms. And what it's asserting is that there's banks play the role of intermediaries. Banks do not actually lend in this model. Instead, they enable one group, I'm calling them creditors here, to lend to another group, I'm calling debtors. And what that means is there's a transfer of money from the creditor's account to the debtor's account when a credit is positive. If debt is repaid, then credit's negative and the money flows the other way. If there's any outstanding debt, then the debtor has to pay interest to the creditor and to give the bank some skin in the game here. I'm pretending that they charge an intermediation fee and that's charged equally to both creditors and debtors. So that gives banks some money to spend. And then I've got them spending it back on both creditors and debtors again. That's an extremely simple model. And I'm keeping it that way because I want to highlight what happens when you change this from the fictional model the textbooks teach to the real world. Like everyone else, I'm having a Cyber Monday sale. This is the only time of year that we have a sale. So you have to act now to take advantage of the exclusive bonuses we're offering. So please go to cyber.stevekeen.com and take advantage of the sale and join me in my growing band of rebel economists. It isn't just that you'll save money by taking advantage of our Black Friday Cyber Monday sale. It's that you'll understand money and economics far better than anyone who gets led astray by a mainstream economist. So to make this into a simulation model, I've made the simplest possible model. You can find this model in Karl Marx at one political extreme and Milton Friedman at the other, just saying that GDP is generated by the turnover of existing money. So I add up the amount of money in the creditor's account and the debtor's account, and I call that the money supply, and then I model money by the velocity with which money turns over per year. So $100 in bank accounts turning over twice per year generates GDP of $200, and then I've got a, a fraction of uh, money which is lent out. It happens to be I've got this negative here, but I can press the up and down arrow keys to change that amount during a simulation. So if, for example, uh, credit was 10% of GDP, then there'd be $20 uh, lent per year in that situation. I then have, uh, of course, interest is paid on outstanding debt, and then a fee is charged by the bank on that interest. And to make it extremely simple to flip from one model to the other, I'm just pretending, and this is another piece of pretense, that banks spend their income instantly. So if we were living in the textbook model in which banks only make income out of intermediation, then I've got them spending the entire fee. And if I go across to the real world model where banks 
charge interest, then I've got them spending the interest. Now, just to make it completely simple so I can leave the banks out of the aggregate model, I could make a more complicated model which included them, but it would just be more complicated with exactly the same results. That's why I'm sticking with this simple little model here. So what I can now do, let's just simulate this model and I'll start with credit being equal to zero. So there's no lending going on at all. So we start here, so credit at zero. And then what happens is nothing changes. Uh, there's no credit being offered. GDP is $200 per year. The amount of money in the bank accounts remains at 50 in both cases, and there's no private debt. Now, what we ha happens if we say that, let's say credit is 1% of GDP per year, then you can see now that there's money's being transferred from the creditor's account to the debtor's account, but they're also paying interest, uh, and that starts to be a problem for the creditors. So at some point, the, the debtors can start to decide not to borrow any more money, and then the money gets transferred the other way because there's being interest being paid on the outstanding level of debt. If the creditors get worried and decide to pay their debt gown, so they go to negative credit, so credit's actually falling, then you get back to the point where the uh, the big accounts balance once more. And you can see I've got huge changes going on in the credit ratios and huge changes in the amount of money in the bank accounts, but nothing has happened to GDP at all. So with all those changes, nothing's occurred in GDP. Macroeconomics is about GDP. So this says, oh, you can leave the banking sector out when you model the macro economy. Well, that's nonsense. The reason it's nonsense is because it's not true that banks are intermediaries. Banks actually are the ones doing the lending. So I can now modify this model and say, let's make it like the real world. So it's not true that the creditors do the lending, the banks do. So I can delete the column showing debt as an asset of the creditors here, and I can make space for it up on the bank's table and say debt is actually an asset of the banking sector. And you can see that credit's now turning up on this line. Now, I've got three entries there. That's because I haven't got rid of the fiction that the creditors are doing the lending. So I delete that line. That's now fixed up. It's also not true that the interest is paid to the creditors. It's paid to the banks. So I can delete that line. And I come over here and say interest is actually paid to the banks here. And just for simplicity, I can get rid of the, the fiction of intermediation from each of those three accounts. So now I've gone from the fictional textbook model to the real world and to make uh, the change here that keep the bank out of the whole system. I simply say a uh, bank spend all the interest income. You can see the little switch down here flicks from fee to interest uh, when I go across to bond. So now I've got the real world, incredibly simple model, starting also let's start with no, no credit at all. And again, I run the system and nothing happens when you've got no credit. But what if there's money being lent by the banks? Look what happens. It's two things which didn't happen in the previous model. The amount of money in the economy is increasing because of the lending. GDP is rising because of the lending. Now, you can see the debt ratio of debtors to creditors is rising as well. It's starting to taper because money is coming back uh, into the economy from interest payments as well. Let's say creditors get worried about the amount of interest they're paying and decide to pay the debt down a bit. GDP falls. This is the real world. Credit has dramatic effects upon economic activity because it changes the amount of money in existence, as well as who has the money. This is why you cannot ignore banks and debt and money in macroeconomics. But that's precisely what conventional economists do. This is the source of the mistake they make to believe they can model the macroeconomy without considering the banking sector, without considering private debt, and without considering even the money supply. This is why they're so dangerously wrong. So we need to go from the textbook model to the real world. And when we do, it's the approach to economics that I take that comes out of the work of non-orthodox economists like Irving Fisher, Hyman Minsky, Joseph Schumpeter, Basil Moore, all these people have been trying to get realism into economics and we've been prevented by neoclassical economists who want to simply hang on to a fictional model in which they can ignore the banking sector and treat capitalism as if it's a barter system. So what I'm trying to do by taking on mainstream economists is not just being an irritating little bastard, though of course they do precisely think that's what I am. I'm irritated by having models which are unrealistic, false, and lead us to making catastrophic mistakes about how we manage the real economy. It's incredibly simple to show why they're wrong, but it involves economists having to eat humble pie and realize they've made a mistake. They should include the banking sector in the macroeconomic models. 
but they'll never do it. Neoclassical economists, this is so fundamental to the way they think about capitalism that if they include the fact that banks create money, that money becomes part of aggregate demand and aggregate income by its turnover, they've got to cease being neoclassical economists. They're not about to do it. It's even more difficult than imagining somebody who's a Christian becoming a Buddhist or becoming a Muslim. They're not going to change their religion. And the cost of their not changing their religion is that the economy you operate in works badly because they've mangled our policies about controlling the economy. We need to get rid of neoclassical economists, neoclassical economics at least, to be able to have a decent way of managing a capitalist economy.